this is the red line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. October 1st, 2049. Just 28 years, 8 months, and 20 days from now. That is the deadline for an event that could likely lead to a nuclear war between some of the major powers. This date, October 1st, 2049, is the date set by Xi Jinping in his speech to the Chinese Communist Party. The date given for Taiwan to be integrated into the People's Republic of China. Whether or not Taiwan wants it. Right now the situation sits in a terrible limbo, with neither side happy with the situation. We will talk more about it later, but after the Chinese Civil War, the Chinese nationalists were forced off the Chinese mainland and onto the island of Taiwan, forever vowing to one day return and recapture the mainland from the communists. And so a tale of two Chinas began, one that would have 24 million people and one that would have 1.4 billion people, one that would have the 22nd highest GDP and one that would have the first or second highest GDP. One nation that would become a democratic state looking towards the West, and the other, the largest communist country in the world. To this day, two-thirds of Taiwanese no longer identify as Chinese, but as Taiwanese. And this is a statement that continues to grow and get more and more polarized, meaning China has an uphill battle here, and they know it. At the time of this split, the Cold War was kicking off, and like everyone else in Asia, each government started looking towards the great powers with Taiwan throwing itself in the US camp and China towards the Soviet Union, the results of which Taiwan still follows to this day. These days, China is flexing its muscles in the region and is much stronger than where the two split back in 1949. It's captured Tibet, it's captured Xinjiang, it's retaken into Mongolia, and now the last territory, the last scrap to bring them back to the glory days, is Taiwan. The Chinese have vowed to get it back, and get it back by 2049. But could they actually do it? Does China have the capabilities to take the island of Taiwan? I mean, strictly on paper, you would say yes. But the situation is a lot more complicated and is far more likely to drag in many of the great powers than one would expect. So this week we ask the question, could China invade Taiwan? In full disclosure and for the sake of neutrality, both countries in this claim to be the real China, and even now there are people who suggest that I call these two countries the People's Republic of China and Chinese Taipei, and others who will suggest I refer to it as the Republic of China and the mainland Chinese. But for this piece, and for neutrality's sake, I will be referring to both sides by their most common names. I will be referring to the PRC or the People's Republic of China as China, and I will be referring to the Republic of China as Taiwan. Let's go over the details and ask the question, could China invade Taiwan? And to talk more about that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. The Two Dragons I think it's a linchpin of so much in terms of the US approach to Asia and how the United States structures its relationship with Taiwan is rapidly becoming like one of the essential questions of the 21st century and especially the US-China relationship as well. And Taiwan has kind of always played a uh, an important role in that in that framework, but its importance going forward I think is going to become even more so. Eric Gomez is the Director of Defense Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, specializing in East Asia. Eric has written a number of fantastic papers on the power balance in Asia and what it means going forward, as well as what options the US and its allies have in front of them. He joins us today. Taiwan was ceded to Japan as a result of the First Sino-Japanese War, which went from 1894 to 1995. But then after the Japanese took control of Taiwan, they were plagued by a pretty long-running guerrilla conflict with the people there, uh, and it took them quite some time to actually establish a degree of control over the island. And 
this, when Japan was then subsequently defeated in World War II, uh, Taiwan's uh, jurisdiction went back over uh, to the Republic of China. Taiwan has a rich and complicated history, but for today's topic, we are just going to focus on the country's modern aspects. After the Japanese surrendered in World War II, they handed Taiwan back over to the Republic of China, whilst the Civil War slowly simmered away. Although four years later, the Civil War finally came to a head. The two main sides of the war were between the democratic Western-backed Republic of China, known as the Kuomintang or KMT, and the Communist People's Republic of China, also known as the PRC. But in 1949, towards the end of the major fighting, the situation for Taiwan became a lot more complicated. Can you take us through this frankly tumultuous period? So in the Chinese Civil War, um, the, the KMT was winning in the early 30s before um, the attack by Japan or the invasion of, of China by Japan. During that time, um, the KMT and CCP were both focused on fighting the Japanese uh, military, and but the KMT more so uh, than the CCP or the Chinese Communist Party. And as a result, when the war was over, um, you had a KMT that was, or, or a Republic of China that was pretty weakened relative to where the communists were. Uh, Mao starts getting some more support uh, in the aftermath of World War II from the Soviet Union. And the United States is faced with this question of, you know, who do you back? Um, at the time, there wasn't really much uh, love for Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the KMT, uh, among uh, U.S. officials, uh, because um, at the time, I th that was you know, that was kind of before uh, the Communist Party did some of the major atrocities that it's known for today were obviously well before things like Tiananmen Square, well before the uh, the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution. So at the time, you know, the the with the KMT being the ruling party, we sort of knew a bit more about some of their tendencies. And they brought some of these to Taiwan with them uh, when they fled uh, to the island near the end of the Chinese uh, Civil War. And you know, some of those tendencies were very fond of secret police, <laughs> very fond of using um, intelligence services to disappear people. Uh, you know, I the 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 democracy that Taiwan is today is definitely not <laughs> what it was um, when Chiang Kai Shek and uh, the the rest of the KMT and ROC leadership fled. Uh, to the island after being defeated in the Chinese Civil War. And that also, like I mentioned earlier, created some hesitancy <laughs> within the United States of, you know, who do you throw your support behind? Um, because after World War II was over, it seemed like, you know, the KMT wasn't really, it certainly wasn't a friend of democracy or freedom uh, based off of its actions. And the CCP wasn't as well known, but I think the Americans working in you know, the, the, the China hands that they were called, uh, working in China and seeing it. And this was partly, you know, good perception manipulation by Mao Zedong um, and, and his, and his uh, fellow leaders at the time. But, you know, there was a sense that this, this communist government might have more legitimacy with the people uh, than the KMT did. And that kind of, the U.S. never really supported Mao in the 40s, but it it didn't throw as much support behind um, Chiang Kai-shek. And as a result of that, it, it becomes kind of like, you know, we have a lot of discussions today about, you know, who lost China. Um, and and in the context of, you know, we, we did all this opening and allowed them to join the WTO and become more integrated with the global economy. And that's now catching up to us, right? Like we shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake is, is the, the sort of dominant line of discussion in Washington right now. And it frankly mirrors a lot of what happened in the late forties where um, a lot of state department folks in Asia were kind of uh, more th thinking that Mao Zedong and the, and the communists were going to be uh, the party that should be backed or 
that they had more of a legitimate claim uh, to govern as a result of the Civil War and some unsavory things that the KMT was doing at the time. And then when the communists took power and, and started doing those awful things, there was a lot of backlash on that decision of like, well, oh no, like how could we have been so naive or how could we have let this happen? And, and you know, they lost China and, and several of the China hands um, were went got, got people went after them pretty heavily in the McCarthy period in the United States uh, in terms of accusing them of being communist agents and and running them out of the State Department and ending their careers. Um, so it's, you know, history is kind of repeating somewhat, I think, in that regard. And in terms of a lot of decisions of the last few decades and U.S.-China policy being questioned and, and, you know, oh, like, did we lose it or did we get it wrong and who's responsible and, and all that kind of stuff is happening again. In the sunset days of the Chinese Civil War, the communists had captured all of the Chinese mainland and would later go on to occupy Xinjiang and Tibet. Defeated, the Chinese Republicans fled to the island of Taiwan and a handful of small islands in the Taiwan Strait, basing their government from the island's capital of Taipei. If the communists had had such an overwhelming victory, why didn't they push over the Taiwan Strait and try to wipe out the last of the KMT in Taiwan? What was stopping them doing that? Chiang Kai-shek, after coming over to Taiwan in in the late 40s, he was raring to go back. He was hoping that the United States would lend naval support uh, to have his forces come back and attack and retake uh, mainland China from the communists. And the United States wasn't really down to do that, um, but the United States also didn't want uh, Mao and company sort of finishing the job of the of the Chinese Civil War and, and taking Taiwan either. Um, so we get a mutual defense treaty um, in the fifty in the early fifties, and the CCP couldn't really do much about it because you know in, invading islands is very difficult. Uh, the the Chinese attempted to do some amphibious operations on some of the offshore islands. Um, in the late stages of the Chinese Civil War, and some of them went okay, but some of uh, one of them in particular, I think it was the Kinmen, they tried to do an amphibious landing, and that was across a very short distance, right? Like um, on the orders of maybe tens of kilometers, and that went terribly, <laughs> terribly wrong uh, for the PLA. And when you're dealing with the even further distances of the strait, um, you know, T Taiwan was able to kind of concentrate defensive forces on a shorter area than it was before when it was fighting the Civil War. So the prospect of that at the time and, and for, you know, a long, long period of several decades was just not going to happen. And and Chinese defense strategy uh, also for most of its history has was very much about being ready for an attack from the outside, uh, being ready for a U.S. invasion, being ready for a Soviet invasion when the China-Soviet relationship went in the toilet. So they were much more insular and much more focused on building a defense strategy to protect um, themselves from great powers throughout the Cold War. The, the sort of uh, uh, long-term fact of the difficulties of amphibious attack and the difficulties of an island invasion uh, were were pretty hard limitations on on China and and their attempt to uh, retake Taiwan by force. This period was during the heart of the Cold War, but before the Sino-Soviet split. At this point in time, the U.S. assumed Beijing and Moscow were working together for a very long time. So the U.S. threw its weight behind Taiwan, eventually signing a mutual defense treaty to defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. But why would Washington do this? What were they hoping to gain from a defense treaty with Taipei? You know, in, in the in the late 40s when the Chinese Civil War is still going on, CCP isn't really seen as too big of a problem, or at least not big enough to risk another conflict right, after, right on the heels of World War II. And then I think the experience in the Korean War and seeing what the CCP did after it came to power really changes U.S. perceptions very quickly. 
when, when China <laughs> gets the bomb in the 60s, in the early 60s, for example, there there's a freak out <laughs> in the United States about, oh, you know, are they going to use it? Or, you know, what does this mean? And and I think that that kind of fluctuation, it's something we still see today in, U, in U.S. policy towards China, right? It, it seems like our our outlook on China vacillates wildly between like, either not a problem or maybe you can cooperate with them. And by this, I mean the CCP, like not a problem, maybe you can cooperate to biggest threat in the world uh, or, or really, really big problem in the region. And that existed in, in the Cold War. And I think, you know, when we when we started getting the alliance with, um, with Chiang Kai-shek and, and Taiwan and putting troops uh, in, in Taiwan, you know, we were thinking about the spread of communism in Asia, uh, U.S. Taiwan was an important location for the United States logistically during the Vietnam War, for example. Um, and initially, the the I think the commitment was born out of you know countering the CCP, trying to prevent the spread of communism in Asia further. Um, and then after Taiwan becomes a democracy, uh, I think the the tone shifts markedly in terms of how the United States thinks about its relationship with Taiwan to being, you know, then you start seeing more of this rhetoric about, well, Taiwan can be an example of how a democracy can work in a Chinese culture or a Chinese society. Taiwan is an incredibly crucial spot for the US Chinese containment strategy that we talked about a few times on this program, particularly in our Philippines piece we did a few months ago. Taiwan is right in the middle of all the U.S. important strategic anchor points for the South China Sea. The U.S. Japanese bases at Okinawa are only 500 kilometers to the northeast of Taiwan. Taiwan is only 250 kilometers north of the Philippines, only 500 kilometers northeast from Hong Kong, and only 1,000 kilometers from the Chinese submarine bases at Hainan, but crucially only 100 kilometers from the Chinese mainland. To complicate things further, the smaller Taiwanese-controlled islands like Kinmen are only 2.5 kilometers from the Chinese mainland. You can literally see China from the small islands controlled by Taiwan. So Taiwan is in a crucial spot, and the US needs Taiwan as part of its wall of bases strategy to contain China in the South China Sea in the event of a war. Because of this, it's pretty easy to see why the US threw their support behind Taiwan. But officially, things are a bit of a different story these days, with Beijing and Taipei claimed to be the rightful rulers of all of China, stretching from the Western Mountains all the way to Taipei. And neither side will back down from that position. This forces a situation where every government has to choose and only recognize one of the Chinese governments, whether it be in Taipei or Beijing. In the early days, most people recognized the ROC based out of Taipei, but as the PRC in Beijing began to reach out to the world and flex its economic muscles, countries began to shift their recognition, and this included the US and its NATO partners. As a result of which, Beijing was given Taipei's spot in the UN Security Council, and all of the benefits that come with it. More and more countries have been switching their recognitions, and now there are just 15 countries left in the world that recognize Taipei as the official capital of China. The largest of these being just Guatemala. Most of these countries are very small Pacific-based islands. So how do we get to this situation? So the United States switches its recognition in the early 70s. Um, although I think the, the official change happens in, actually might have happened in 79, but um, you know Nixon's going to China, right? The Nixon and Kissinger's effort. And product of the Cold War, a uh, pretty classic understanding of that, where there were real differences uh, between the Soviet Union and, and, and China at that point. The United States thought it could split the communist world in two uh, by driving a wedge and, and, and flipping the Chinese over more friendly to us. And I'd argue that at work. I know I know it's pretty, pretty fun to beat up on, on Kissinger these days. Um, but I mean, I think he, he fundamentally got that right, uh, at the time. And, you know, there's also a matter of kind of, uh, uh, inevitability in it where, you know, you had on one side a, uh, you know, 
if, if there can only be one, then the the one that has, you know, the mainland part of China and all the people, or not all the people, but most of the people, um, and most of the economic power and most of the political power probably should be uh, the, the, the representative on the Security Council probably should be uh, the official one. Um, and, you know, the ROC initially didn't want to, it never gave up its claim to controlling all of China because from Chiang Kai-shek perspective at the outset, this was like a, te- a temporary setback and, you know, give me some ships USA and I'll go across and, and retake it at the earliest possible convenience. Um, and ever since that sort of produced a kind of tenuous status quo where um, Taiwan has has never formally declared its existence as an independent country, even though it operates as an independent country uh, in, in, you know, de facto. Um, and that, you know, people who are very pro-Taiwan in the United States point out that that's kind of a, a, a silly fiction, a lie that we all tell ourselves that this isn't an independent country. And it's like, I mean, I, I kind of agree with them in terms of, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fiction we sort of tell ourselves, but the, it's a fiction that exists for a reason because the United States for, I think pretty much its entirety with its relationships uh, with the ROC government on Taiwan has been, look, we don't want, we don't want a war to happen. We don't want there to be armed conflict in the Taiwan Strait. And we've gotten to that by trying to maintain the status quo of uh, Taiwan's de facto independence, but not de jure independence. And in the early 2000s, when, when the Taiwanese were, were thinking about uh, you know, host, hosting a referendum uh, to address this issue and maybe declare themselves independent, the Bush administration told them, like, if, if this happens and this starts a conflict, we're not coming. <laughs> we're not going to ride to the rescue because that's not part of the deal. Um, and for a long time, that has been the U.S. policy. This might be changing, though. Uh, there's especially as the the U.S. China relationship deteriorates. I think there's growing support for a U.S. position on Taiwan within within Washington, uh, especially among China hawks. Of well, we should just recognize them, right? We we should recognize Taiwan as an independent entity, um, and we should the U.S. should do everything it can to improve our relations with an independent Taiwan. Um, and, you know, I I think the likelihood of that happening is growing, even if it's still relatively small. Um, and if it does happen, I think that would be, you know, the big thing that preventing that from happening is like, that would pretty much erase all, <laughs> all aspects of the US uh, China relationship. So that that's kind of why, you know, the, the, um, the world sort of slowly acknowledge the CCP in China over Taiwan as like the sole representative of China in the international system. Because of this situation, Taiwan relies heavily on other nations to speak on behalf of it at the United Nations, meaning every single country that recognizes them is incredibly important. Many countries in Africa that once did recognize Taipei as the capital were promised decent Chinese investment to recognize the People's Republic of China, an offer that many of these smaller nations around the world could not afford to refuse. So the numbers kept dwindling, and now Taiwan is down to just 15 nations that recognize it. Instead of going very broad, Taiwan instead invests heavily into US-backed Pacific Islands like Palau and the Solomons. They invest in things like the national baseball team, schools and events to keep the populations with a very positive outlook on Taipei. How long these islands can afford to hold out their recognition though is still up for debate and is still an ongoing question. But one of the weirdest aspects of this recognition problem comes with operations. The US and its partners factor Taiwan heavily into their regional defense plans, but however, do not do any official joint military exercises with Taiwan. If the US and Taiwanese militaries are so connected, why doesn't the US do joint exercises with Taiwan? Well, I can't speak to the other countries, but I know for, I think for the US, this stems from what I mentioned earlier about the delicate balancing act the U.S. walks of 
of wanting to to prevent a conflict in the Taiwan Strait, having support for Taiwan, but support that is very carefully calculated. Um, which is why when the Trump administration started, you know, very publicly sending uh, military officials or like, you know, I think it was a three-star admiral or general uh, visited uh, not too long ago. And then cabinet secretaries, um, again, no one like in this, not state department, not defense, but, um, but sending someone in the cabinet to go to Taiwan, it, it's this, it's this very delicate balancing act of like, how do you show support without doing something where China responds? Because if you look at, there's been three Taiwan Strait crises uh, over the years, two in the 50s and one in the night in the mid 90s. And in all the instances, you know, what really China basically instigated crises when things happened in the in the U.S. Taiwan relationship, where China was like, if we let this go further, or if we let this, uh, if, if we don't signal that we still care about this, then they might get the wrong impression that we don't. Um, and so a lot of U.S. policy has been, okay, how do we do things to try and prevent that kind of reaction from the Chinese? Um, so that way we can keep with this, you know, if, if you're very pro-Taiwanese, keep up with this fiction, right, of, of, a, of a de facto but not de jure independent country. And part of that is not doing joint military exercises. Um, now, Taiwan does send fighter pilots to the United States to do uh, F-16 training. Um, and there's lots of sort of quiet ways that the U.S. Uh, works with Taiwan and, and, and tries to assist on self-defense. You know, the, the loud thing is arms sales, but there's other things. In the last few months when there was a U.S. visit, from the reporting I saw, it sounded like, oh, this isn't, this wasn't the first time, right, that, the, that these kind of visits have been happening. But, you know, the reason you keep them quiet is that if you don't make them public, then the Chinese don't feel pressure to respond to them publicly. Um, and, and that's kind of the, an, an example again of, of that balancing act where the U S is like show support without like doing it too overtly. Um, but that begs the question of, you know, will this continue forever? Will the United States continue to kind of, play the tightrope game like it has for decades or does this great power competition period with china put more pressure on the united states to more vocally support taiwan if if the us china relationship broadly speaking is breaking apart at the seams then you know the the sort of incentive that both beijing and the us have to keep this sort of balancing act in place in the Taiwan Strait erodes, right? Because there's, you know, what's the point of preserving that if so much is also going off the rails anyway? And so, you know, these are the things I worry about um, because I'm not actually convinced that the United States uh, can effectively, you know, do what it wants to do in terms of uh, defending Taiwan without carrying some really high costs slash risk of nuclear escalation. Weirdly enough, the more we began to dig into Taiwan for research, we found there was more and more similarities with the defense of North Korea and their situation, just on the opposite side of the geopolitical split. In our North Korea piece, we describe the nation as a porcupine. A porcupine is a small furry animal about the size of a small dog. They have adorable little faces and mostly just eat bark and leaves and fruit. Although the thing that keeps them alive is the fact they're covered in razor sharp spikes, like a thousand little spears shooting out in every direction. The porcupine can't really pose a threat to any of its predators. But the predators can't eat the porcupine either, because trying to attack its spikes would be a nightmare. Both Taiwan and North Korea have adopted the porcupine principle. Neither nation can do much damage in offensive operations, or even hope to conquer its neighbors. But a US invasion of North Korea or a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be incredibly bloody, costly, 
and probably not worth the price. So let's take a look at this and go through exactly how an invasion of Taiwan by China would likely play out, how bloody it would be, and what the likely outcome would be. And to talk more about this, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. The Normandy Problem yeah, probably the, the most important thing to take away from big picture when we look at, at Taiwan's defense strategy is that Taiwan has, uh, you know, been positioned opposite the Chinese mainland um, for the entire time that we've had um, a regime on Taiwan and um, the PRC in, in Beijing. Um, and over the course of that time, China's military power has grown tremendously. Um and so Taiwan's ability to defend itself was always in, uh, dependent on being embedded in the American alliance system. But there is um, a, a system of security partnerships in Asia. Um, but what we've seen over the course of the, you know, the last 20 or so years is really a, a dramatic change in the balance of military power across the Taiwan Strait as China has spent more on its military um, over the you know double digit growth in in defense and military expenditure, procuring new hardware um, across land, air and sea power, um, but particularly air and sea power for the case of Taiwan. I mean, all of of that uh, spending is, you know, the, the first sort of contingency that the PLA is oriented toward is a Taiwan Straits contingency or, or scenario. And so you have an island of, you know, around 25 million people um, on the one hand and the mainland, which is, you know, 1.3, 1.4 billion people um, with a much larger economy. And so the amount that, um, that China can spend on its military simply overwhelms Taiwan's capability um, to, to certainly to match uh, the PRC, um, which hasn't which it hasn't been able to do for a long time, but increasingly now uh, creates doubts over Taiwan's ability to defend itself in a scenario where China might try to coerce or alter the status quo across the Taiwan Strait by force. Sheena Chestnut Grudens is a national security expert currently teaching at the University of Texas and the LBJ School. She's also a non-resident fellow with the Brookings Institute and an author of Dictators and the Secret Police, all about China and East Asia. Sheena is a fantastic expert on the strategic defense problems of the region, and we are very happy to have her join us today. It's always been defined as one of the PRC's core interests, and it is, um, in some ways, like uh, Tibet or Xinjiang, um, considered unfinished business in terms of consolidating the CCP's control over um, the territory of China. And so from Beijing's standpoint, there are different forces that are trying to pull the, you know, the, the, the PRC, the country that the CCP essentially built piece by piece over the course of its rise to power. Um, you know, there are a number of different forces that are trying to, to pull the PRC back apart. That's Beijing's view. Um, and so that's where you get the language about separatism in uh, which is one of the common phrases or common framings that links Taiwan to places like um, like Xinjiang and Tibet, even though they are culturally and historically very, very different and have had very, very different relationships with the, the Chinese mainland and with the Chinese Communist Party. In the case of, of Taiwan, um, the uh, the island for a very long time, several decades, was governed by the party that lost the civil war on the mainland. And so it was the opposition to uh, the CCP in its struggle for political power. Um, now, what's interesting about Taiwan is that unlike some of the other places that, that the CCP lumps under this, this term separatist, um, you know, Taiwan is, is no longer ruled by the party um, that the CCP beat in the Civil War. Um, it, is, it is now a, a vibrant, thriving democracy, and the party that's in power is the opposition party. And so, you know, one of the big structural shifts that we have to think about in terms of the, the sort of joint diplomatic and military context is that the whole structure of cross-strait relations, which was sort of first uh, set 
in its its contemporary form in the 1970s under the arrangements or the agreements made by President Nixon and his administration, um, you know, were done within a Cold War framework and a framework in which Taiwan was not a democracy and democracy didn't um, necessarily weight as heavily in international and global legitimacy as it does today. And so one of the big things to think about is that Taiwan's democratization, I think, really changed the nature of the political calculus on cross-strait relations. What are the reasons why the United States is aligned with Taiwan? Why does it have this alliance? Why is this alliance worth preserving? And what is the United States actually doing when it provides, ar quote unquote, arms of a defensive character to Taiwan? Um, you know, all of that changed uh, somewhat, at least, with um, Taiwan's democratization, even if the agreements and the frameworks didn't themselves change to accommodate that geopolitical reality. And so I, I think it's, you know, this, this place is a different kind of strain on the cross-strait relationship and raises a, a slightly different set of questions for the United States relationship with Taiwan itself as well as the United States position on Taiwan that it communicates to the CCP and to you know the PRC government in Beijing. So when we talk about defending Taiwan against the Chinese attack, there seems to be three different camps of thought on how it could be achieved, all with varying levels of credibility. So I want to go through each of these and see which ones might actually be viable to defend the Taiwanese island. The first is a naval defense. The Taiwan Navy is dwarfed by the Chinese Navy by many magnitudes, but some Taiwanese claim that by sticking to the coast and using hit and run tactics with their Navy, they might be able to prevent a Chinese landing on the Taiwanese main island. Do you think this would actually be achievable with the small amount of Navy the Taiwanese possess? Taiwan, like I said, there's just a structural constraint in terms of how much Taiwan can spend on its military. And like many, many other countries in Asia, um, or it, it is just not possible for the island of Taiwan to spend enough to go head to head with Chinese military power. That's that's just not realistic. And so in the sense, you know, that you're talking about the Taiwan Navy's ability to, to defend itself against a potential invasion, um, you know, yeah, that's that's probably not realistic. It's it's not necessarily realistic for for any country in Asia. Yeah, this is this is a a um, a feature of power politics and of of military competition in Asia that we're seeing. You know, not just in the Taiwan Strait. It's most acute. It's most pressing. It's most immediate there. Um, but there is, I don't think, a, I don't think there is a country in Asia that could probably, you know, would would come out well in a bilateral head-to-head -head with the Chinese military. Um, the, the power differentials are simply too great and the resources that the, the PLA can bring to bear um, in a crisis scenario are simply too great for that to be a, a realistic or certainly the dominant preferable strategy for, for almost any country um, that I can think of. The problem is that there are two different theories in U.S. politics about how best to do that, how best essentially to deter or prevent that scenario from arising. One says, um, look, the basic issue is the erosion of the military balance. And so, um, you know, what the United States has to do, the U.S. role in this is essentially to even out deterrence by selling sufficient arms, the phrase in, in the relevant um, legislation and agreements is arms of a defensive character. So so the obligation to, to defend, um, uh, to, to allow Taiwan the capability to, to defend itself. And um, that's, that's one theory about essentially the deterrence model, how you you prevent um, a situation from arising in which Beijing decides to act um, coercively and militarily toward Taiwan. Um, but there's a, there's another theory which says, OK, look, Beijing is essentially a little bit more defensive than we think or than some people think. And actually, Beijing won't rock the boat as long as Taiwan doesn't alter the status quo. So, so instead of deterrence, the job we actually have is more reassurance. And instead of bolstering Taiwan, which might embolden them to do things that would provoke Beijing, what we actually need to do is reassure not Taiwan, but Beijing. 
Um, and so therefore, we need to spend a lot more time in diplomacy with the PRC, and we actually need to restrain Taiwan from doing things that might trigger, say, the 2005 anti-secession law that was passed by the National People's Congress. And these aren't completely incompatible strategies, but a lot of the debates you hear about Taiwan policy in the United States are based on the fact that people hold these two different assumptions about what the problem is. And if you diagnose the problem differently, you're going to naturally see that, that there are, are different solutions. And so, um, you know, as it relates to the, the military um, dimension of the Taiwan Straits issue, I just I think it's important to remember that there's at least a handful of people who have exercised pretty significant um, influence over U.S. China policy and Taiwan policy um, who see sort of a fundamentally different task involved in, in preventing conflict. The million dollar question is which theory is right and, you know, has that changed as a result of Xi Jinping's time in power? Xi Jinping has made statements that he would like to see the Taiwan issue settled in, in his time um, as the, you know, the leader of China. Um, that would worry me a little bit more because we're coming up on the end of his second term and we would have a very, very short time window, which means the risks would get a lot higher. Um, but because we assume that he's, he's going to extend and take a third term, um, I think that gives people a little bit more time to, to try to find a solution or at least, um, you know, keep the, the status quo, um, right now. Um, but the, the point is that either way, um, somebody's articulated an, an end game or a time limit to this process, and we're not quite sure what it is, um, but time pressure is one thing that could make all of this much, much more fraught and dangerous um, for, for people in China, for people on the island of Taiwan, for, and for people in the United States and throughout the Western Pacific. Taiwan's geography is actually a huge help to the defense strategy. Much of the west coast of Taiwan is mudflats, meaning tanks, vehicles, and landing crafts would almost immediately get bogged in the open flat territory, making them easy targets to pick off with machine guns and anti-tank weapons. The east coast of Taiwan is mostly tall and mountainous with dense jungles, meaning even if the Chinese were to find a spot to land, there would be no way to advance forward. And from everyone's experience with jungle warfare, we also know how costly that option would likely be. What is left is just 15 small beaches dotted around the island of Taiwan. These are the only beaches that would be suitable to land an invasion force. So rather than Taiwan having to defend their whole island, they would only need to concentrate their forces on a few of these beaches. And with satellite technology, they would likely know ahead of time which of these small beaches the invasion would be taking place at, to allow even further concentration of their forces. Do you think the throw them back into the sea strategy is a viable option for Taiwanese defense, and could it work to defend against such a larger foe in the event of a Chinese attack? There are certain choke points created by the geography of Taiwan for an amphibious landing. But we also have to remember that that's not the only way to get people to Taiwan, right? There's there's a question of, of landing planes. Um, and Taiwan periodically does drills. I remember, you know, quite vividly being taken aback by one of these the first time I saw it when I was living in Taipei at one point for dissertation research, um, where there's an exercise where they practice landing aircraft on the highways. Um, and so we have to remember that if the Chinese or the United, if the, if the you know, Taiwan military can practice doing that, um, and if the U.S. military um, you know, has looked at that capability in a crisis scenario, we have to assume that the, the PLA Air Force um, has looked at that as a possibility as well. Um, so, you know, yes, that, that count may well be accurate, um, but we have to remember that, um, that there's not, um, that there's more than one way to move equipment and troops to the island itself. Um, and we also have to remember that, you know, um, generally, although, um, you know, these scenarios tend to, to favor the defender. Um, there are debates about exactly what kind of attacker defender ratio or offense defense ratio you would need in an invasion scenario uh, and an amphibious landing scenario. Um, this is something that both militaries 
practice for and train for. And again, this is a case where the the you know the numerical advantages on the Chinese side are in terms of manpower are also pretty immense. Um, Taiwan's been trying to switch to an all volunteer force. Um, that's constrained the amount that Taiwan can spend on its military. Um, it's part of the reason why some of its its naval and air assets are old, um, and why arms sales from the United States are so important um, to Taiwan's security. Um, but you know, again, this is a case where the sh the sheer math of the numbers um, puts at least some advantage to. Um, on the the side of the PLA and um, the Chinese military, and so really one of the theories is that the the you know Taiwan's the biggest thing that Taiwan can do for its own security is to harden its defenses and make an invasion as costly as possible. Again, with the idea that that would deter um, the PRC from attempting that kind of invasion scenario in the first place. The third option people are advocating for for Taiwan is similar to the Vietnamese or Chechen plans for their invasions. Have a large part of your population armed and trained and ready for warfare. So when the Chinese land, instead of fighting the Chinese head to head, you pull back into the urban centers, the rough mountains and the dense jungles, and you fight a nasty guerrilla warfare strategy, slowly bleeding your evaders dry, making it very difficult to take anything. Do you think this would be a viable option for the Taiwanese defense? Yeah, I mean, again, I think this is, um, you know, at this point, you're so far into a conflict that I think you the fog of war probably um, has taken over at multiple points. And so, um, yes, there are those recommendations that I think goes hand in hand with this idea of hardening Taiwan's defenses and making an invasion incredibly costly. Um, and let me add that, you know, Taiwan's own history has a pretty clear precedent for that. Um, it took the Japanese, um, you know, who um, took over administration of Taiwan in 1895 under the Treaty of Shimonoseki, I think it was, um, it, you know, an additional 10 or 15 years of counterinsurgency and often, um, you know, pretty bloody counterinsurgency type campaigns um, to move from you know, the maritime perimeter and the coastal areas of Taiwan all the way up into the, the, the central mountains and the, the less accessible areas of Taiwan's interior. And so, um, you know, there's a precedent in Taiwan's own history um, of the exactly, you know, that type of prolonged warfare. I think the issue here is that modern um, politics and the international dimensions of of the Taiwan scenario um, at that point come to bear, and I don't know. I I don't know that we have a clear sense. You know, yes, we can strategize. Yes, we can game this out. Um, but it's hard for me to argue that the the PLA or the Chinese military writ large could engage in some sort of prolonged, um, you know, attempt to to take uh, the island of Taiwan without there being a whole lot of international moving parts that would come to bear in ways that um, that make it really hard to say, yeah, and the likely outcome would be X. I think at that point, all bets are off and you're in a really, really unpredictable scenario, um, not just in terms of the military, but in terms of then what the world's reaction to these unfolding events is. And all of that could move very quickly. So I doubt you're going to have a 15-year um, period like the Japanese uh, did um, to sort of, you know, work on this problem, if that makes sense. If the Taiwanese were pursuing this kind of a strategy, you would assume they would move to a conscription slash national service model and have a large reserve force ready to go, much like Singapore does. Although over the last few years, they're moving their force in the complete opposite direction, moving to have a volunteer only army and also drop their personnel from around 500,000 to just under 200,000. If the guerrilla warfare strategy is what the US is recommending to Taipei, why are they pursuing and restructuring their armed forces to go in the opposite direction? Yeah, that's a great a great question. Um, part of it is that the, is the shift to a more professional, all volunteer military um, really uh, means that you have you can invest more in the individual training of soldiers, sailors, airmen, 
um, you know, the the folks um, the folks who will be involved in the defense of Taiwan. Um, the issue with a conscript military um, or national military service, especially if it's a you know a year or two. Um, is that uh, you spend a lot of time training people, um, and then you don't get to keep keep them in the armed forces for very long. They rotate out, and there's a there's a high cost to doing that in terms of of personnel training and readiness. Um, and so, the question is: Is it better overall for Taiwan to have a smaller but more highly trained, professionalized military? Um, and that doesn't necessarily remove the idea that you can. Um, or that the the government on Taiwan can train people for um, uh, for a, a you know civil defense in the type of scenario or the way that you're describing, um, but you know there the goal of shifting to it an all volunteer military is something that that Taiwan has had for a long time. Um, it is slow moving, um, and the other issue is that it also requires that you you pay competitively or closer to competitively. Um, so again, that's another reason why Taiwan's spending is is somewhat constrained. So this is a tough choice, right? Um, I don't um, I don't envy um, the folks in Taiwan who are having to make these these kinds of um, decisions. One of the problems the U.S. has with Taiwan is the fact that it will always have to redemonstrate to China its commitment to the defense of Taiwan. Every time the Chinese saber rattle with Taiwan, the US instinctively run one or two carrier battle groups through the region as a sign of strength and display of commitment to its regional partners. Do you think the Chinese might use this sore spot to keep a US carrier battle group tied up here rather than being somewhere it can be better used like the Mediterranean or the Indian Ocean? Um, one of the things that's been fascinating about Xi Jinping's national security strategy is that he has been willing to up the ante um, and produce tension in multiple of these peripheral regions um, simultaneously. Right. So, so during the time that that Xi Jinping has been in power, if you even just think about the last several years, um, you have increased tension in the South China Sea. But also in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong, and you know um, the continued tension and attention to the Taiwan Strait, um, and I would argue that um, that prioritizing and dealing, you know, having not having multiple. Oh, and 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 the border with India. Um, I can't believe I almost forgot that. Um, right. So you've got all of these conflicts going on at once, and several of them escalating, or at least you know, with a significant increase in tension at the same time. And that's re relatively unusual in China's modern history. Typically, we've seen that China, um, Chinese leaders try to only have one of these hotspots going at once, maybe max two. Um, and so we're seeing a different risk calculus here. Uh, you know, I, my sense is that that is a product of a national security strategy on the part of Xi Jinping, where he talks about internal and external security as being um, you know, interlocking and mutually activated. And the interesting thing about this phrase mutually activated um, is that we're used to thinking of strategy as, oh, if you have an issue at home, you might retrench and solve problems at home um, and cut back on your international or your external commitments. But if Xi Jinping sees that external developments are, are making problems worse at home, ironically, what you can get is a doubling down or a more assertive policy both at home and abroad because those are seen as reinforcing each other. And I actually think, you know, that's um, that's the paradox or, or the conundrum that's at the heart of um, a lot of China's recent behavior and that, you know, I think doesn't fit our typical model of okay, problems at home, so we retrench and we solve those, and, and um, that there's a trade-off between the internal and external. Um, whereas, you know, China's national security strategy doesn't tend to see it that way. There's usually more than one way to skin a cat, so could the Chinese use another method to win this war? Using other means like disinformation and cyber warfare to slowly skew the Taiwanese democracy into a pro-Beijing position helping to elect a government that may be more amenable to a tying Taipei much closer to Beijing? Or is invasion likely the only way to achieve an integration between Taipei and the PRC? 
Well, first of all, I don't know that they're mutually exclusive, right? Um, so there's a lot of time between now and 2049, although less than there, well, less than there used to be, obviously. Um, I, but I, I, you know, I think um, what I see for the foreseeable future is continued pressure, um, right? So, so if um, if the strategy in in Taiwan is to raise the costs to make uh, you know, aggression or coercion across the Taiwan Straits, um, you know, not worth, not worth it. The, the, you know, the, the upsides aren't worth the costs. Um, if that's the calculus that Taiwan is trying to influence, then you have the flip side on, um, on the mainland, right? Which is that they're going to be trying to convince um, the people of Taiwan, as well as the leadership, that it's really not worth it to um to oppose further integration and um uh and deepening of of relations or reintegration um with the mainland that's the sort of the the strategic calculus and i think you're you know you're already seeing very clearly that there are lots of attempts to influence politics in taiwan in that direction um those haven't tended to be you know, terribly successful if you look at, at public opinion polling. Um, but China is also getting more and more sophisticated in terms of its, you know, it, the operations of the United Front Work Department, its, you know, it, its use of information operations overseas. And again, Taiwan is sort of ground zero. It's the front line for a lot of that because it's the most important place for those efforts to succeed. And, you know, even this is a, a game that's played at the margins. Um, and so, you know, even relatively small shifts in public opinion saying it's not worth it to fight um, are, are um, you know, are going to be where I think we're likely to see Beijing's emphasis. Um, and, you know, you can look at, at public opinion data and see that, you know, although um, there's very, very strong identification as of people in Taiwan, the, the vast majority identify as Taiwanese rather than either solely Chinese or, or both Chinese and Taiwanese. Um, you know, when you ask people then the question of would you be willing to fight for Taiwan, um, the, the positive answers get much smaller. Um, and so that disjuncture, I think, is the one that Beijing will try to push um, harder on in any number of ways in the years ahead. And I, again, I think that's a place where, given United States equities and responsibilities under the, the, the Taiwan Relations Act and US legislation, um, you know, that's a really important area for the US and Taiwan, as well as other countries in the Indo-Pacific, to be talking about, to be understanding the lay of the land, and to be thinking about how to address that part of the evolving cross-straits dynamic, um, as well as the military elements. This is geopolitics, so none of this happens in a vacuum. Gone are the days where one country attacks another one, and it just stays between the two of them. Even the very small conflicts like Azerbaijan and Armenia rope in everyone around them from Turkey to Russia to Israel. So you can be damn sure that if the Chinese attack Taiwan, it would elicit some kind of response from the regional players. These would include countries like the US, Japan, South Korea, and Australia, and many more. But what exactly would be their response? What are the likely moves by these players in response to a Chinese attack? Well, for that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. The Cavalry. Taiwan's defense strategy is to make sure that China never militarily invades in the first place. And Taiwan's strategy for this is to make it too, to make it too costly for China to do so. That's the spirit of all the defense agreements, you know, the, the, the weapons purchases, et cetera. It's, it's to make the Chinese feel that they should not even attempt this. Robert Kaplan is an award-winning American author focusing on geopolitics. He was the senior fellow for the Center of a New American Security, a chief analyst for Stratfor, as well as being on the Defense Policy Board for the Department of Defense under the Obama administration. Robert Kaplan is now part of the Eurasia Group, whilst also being named one of foreign policy magazine's top 100 global thinkers. We are very pleased to have Robert join us via phone today. <laughs> 
there are only a few places where China could invade along the coastline, and those would be very heavily defended. But I think we're not really dealing with the straight with the with the the crux of the issue here, which is that a, a combination of weapons purchases by Taiwan and firm U.S. resolve publicly stated that it would not tolerate a Chinese invasion uh, is necessary so that China never thinks of invading in the first place. If there's any um, ambiguity. If, if, if Washington is unsure, if Washington is debating whether or not it's worth it to defend Taiwan, and if Taiwan's weapons purchases are not sufficient, you have a situation where, in certain circumstances, the Chinese may decide to invade Taiwan, and then you would have a real tragedy. In the event China was to invade Taiwan, the U.S. has a pact that it will come to the aid of Taiwan. But if we had a future president of the United States who took his isolationist rhetoric and pushed it even further, deciding not to defend Taiwan, leaving it on its own, what signal do you think that would send to the U.S.'s regional partners like Seoul, Tokyo, Manila, or Jakarta? If the United States ever decided it could not defend Taiwan, that would be the beginning of the end of the U.S. alliance structure in East Asia. Um, because, as I said, every country, Japan, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and so-and-so, would have no choice but to be Finlandized by China, but to be closer to China, because they could not believe that America would ultimately defend them. Taiwan is sort of like the Berlin of the, the you know, the West Berlin of Asia. You know, West Berlin was a big Cold War symbol. I remember this. I covered the Cold War as a young journalist. And it was all about defending West Berlin to make it clear to the Soviets that the United States would do whatever was necessary to defend West Berlin. And Taiwan is kind of in a, is in a, a metaphorical sense analogous to that. One thing I've always questioned about the U.S.-Taiwan strategy is the type of equipment we sell to Taipei. Under the Trump administration, we sold Taiwan first-gen Abrams tanks and F-16s. I mean, the F-16s are good planes, but against Chinese Gen 4 fighters, they really are no match. So why sell Taiwan, frankly, outdated equipment when we readily sell F-35s to countries like South Korea, Singapore, Japan, and even probably Indonesia soon? Um. I believe it is because the Americans have calibrated that if they give Taiwan more up-to-date weapons, it will it will ignite a crisis with China. That they they have to find a sweet spot of selling Taiwan enough weapons to make a Chinese invasion costly. Um, but on the other hand, not sell them so many weapons or such high quality weapons that, um, you know, that it would cause a crisis or a response of some kind from China. That's been the history of U.S. weapons sales to Taiwan going back, I think, before the Reagan administration, um, you know, right up to soon after uh, the United States uh, normalized relations with um with, 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 with mainland China in the early 1970s. It's always been about finding this sweet spot, and the U.S. has struggled with this um, because it's not 100% clear, it never has been, that the U.S. would defend Taiwan in the case of a, of a Chinese military invasion. And, uh, and China has always... Uh, but, you know, has always accepted that it could not be certain that the Americans would not defend Taiwan. So China has been cautious on its side as well. But the trend of history, well, there are two trends. One trend is that America is in a, a more of a neo-isolationist mood. It's tired from, from wars that have not gone well. On the other hand, Tai Taiwanese themselves have become more militant, more anti-China than they had been in the past. So, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really a tense conundrum of a situation. If they don't have the equipment to go fight head-to-head, -head, 
you'd imagine they would go be using an asynchronous warfare strategy and pull back uh, into the urban centers and the jungles and the mountains to fight the Chinese in, in a guerrilla style tactics. Do you think that's actually a viable option for Taiwan, though? Remember, Taiwan is a very wealthy country. Per capita income is very high. The standard of living, the quality of life is extremely high. This is a, a very, you know, upper middle class society, if ever there was one. To imagine such people like moving into the foothills and taking up farms, it's just difficult. Obviously, there's a bit of an assumption as well that if war was to kick off, not only would the U.S. get involved, but it would likely drag the entire Quad in. So that would be Australia, India, and Japan as well. How likely do you think it is that the Quad would actually come to the aid of Taiwan? Um, I, I think the Quad is a great idea. I think it's a great development. It has a lot of potential. But let's not kid ourselves. Without certain U.S. leadership, the Quad or any emerging Asian power network of, of countries that want to balance against China is simply not going to be very credible. The Quad needs U.S. leadership, at least at this point. Maybe in five years it won't. You know, maybe in 10 years it won't. But we're still at the point where the Quad works and or other, uh, you know, countries in Asia that need to balance against China getting together, all that works, provided there's an overarching U.S. security umbrella and leadership. It's the same with NATO. You know, NATO is officially an alliance of, I don't know, 25, 28 countries, I can't remember. But in reality, uh, NATO, NATO is American-led. And, and would not would not have any credibility were it not, because the the, sep, the separation between the level of development and organization of the of the U.S. military and its equipment and that of any other uh, military and its equipment in Europe is just so, so great. It's just such a great divide. And it's the same in the Pacific. Do you think we may see Taiwan offer more basing rights to countries like South Korea, Australia, and Japan in order to get these countries more and further invested into the security of Taiwan? That's an interesting concept. Um, uh, they might. They very well might because, remember, Taiwan and Japan have an interesting history. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Japan, I believe, occupied Taiwan for quite a number of years um uh at the uh, you know a long time ago you know the late 19th early 20th century I, I may have it wrong here but they do have a very close history taiwan is geographically you know the southernmost or close to being the southernmost of japan's ryukyu island chain so that there's a real history there and if and if taiwan could could bring japan could provide can build bases that would lure J Japanese and other countries to be stationed there, that would be a strategic win for Taiwan. But remember, that would not ha happen in a vacuum. Were that to be even contemplated publicly, that, you know, the Chinese pressure on Japan and whatever other countries might be interested in doing likewise would be severe. South Korea now hosts a large contingent of anti-ballistic missile sites, as well as forward deployed missile platforms. Japan has quite a large net of service-to-air missiles, or SAMs, and this gives the U.S. quite a formidable missile and anti-missile capability for the region. Do you think Taiwan would allow similar batteries on its soil to protect against missiles coming out of Hainan and the Chinese South? They might. They might. Uh, this would be an issue of, of the negotiation between the U.S. And, and Taiwan. It would be part of the whole U.S.-Taiwanese relationship. Because remember, go back to the Nixon-Kissinger uh, trip, you know, uh, trip to China in, I think it was January 1972, uh, where they basically made a deal with the Chinese, which is, they, America will recognize mainland China as the only China, and in return, China would not would essentially respect the territorial integrity of Taiwan. And 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 in a sense, that's where we are right now. One glaring problem that the Chinese are facing here is the amount of equipment that you would actually need to pull off an invasion like this. 
It would take huge amounts of transports, logistics, fuel, and coordination. And what I want to know is, do you think the Chinese actually have that sort of equipment ready at the moment to even try to pull off something like an invasion of Taiwan? Remember, the invasion of Normandy involved crossing a body of sea that was about 20 miles wide. The Taiwan Strait, I believe, is about 90 miles wide or something like that. So it's it's a much bigger enterprise than the Normandy invasion simply by, 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 by geography. Also, it could not be done in secret like Normandy, where uh, the Germans thought the, um, the Allies were going to land at a different place because of satellite technology, which would pick up any invasion, any preparations for invasions very early. So it's much, much harder than Normandy. I think Normandy may have been the last great surprise attack in history and in, uh, of that scale because of the advent of satellites. Would China, even were it to invade Taiwan by sea and air, would it be able to hold Taiwan? How much would it cost China? What would be the, the diplomatic fallout? Um, what would be the fallout from trade deals that did not occur because of protests between China and Europe, China and the United States, etc.? Um, you know, you have to think big on this. You can't just... It's not just a matter of numbers, of military numbers, especially in, you know, we're in the 21st century where so much depends on, on economics to a degree that it, that it didn't as much in earlier periods of history because of the, because now we have an integrated uh, world economy and integrated world financial system. So uh, when, when, when the mainland China contemplates the costs of, a, of an invasion of Taiwan, chief among those costs would be the economic fallout. In a party speech, Xi Jinping, leader of China, made the statement that Taiwan would be integrated back into the PRC by the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party's victory, which would make it 2049. At the moment, both sides are nowhere near that, and 2049 is only 28 years away. So something would have to dramatically change. Do you think we should take this 2049 threat seriously, or is it just party rhetoric and Xi knows he likely won't be in power by the time the deadline rolls around in 2049? Well, 2049 is almost 30 years away. Uh, Xi may not be alive then. And if he is, he would be in deep senility, probably. It's, uh, you know, so it's, he's not really risking a lot um, by making that statement. He also may, what he may mean by that statement is that China and Taiwan will be so economically and culturally integrated at that point that the that the way we speak about their relationship now will be different by then because we'll be in a far more smaller shrunken claustrophobic world where taiwan may just be another part of a china but with far more civil liberties obviously for this to occur china would need to change something and escalate the situation whilst also not crossing the U.S.'s red lines and triggering a possibly nuclear war. China has a very capable and aggressive cybersecurity force. If China were to launch a large cyber attack onto Taiwan, do you think that would be enough to trigger a U.S. response, or the U.S. would stay out of it? Interesting question. Fascinating question. Um, a lot would depend on just how big the cyber attack was, if it was followed up with disinformation operations um, and, and some military movement, etc. But, you know, it is possible that you could have a, a cyber attack, not just on Taiwan, but on many places that would be so, you know, that the... Um, you, you know, that the level of that attack could be, the magnitude rather, could be so severe that it would constitute an act of war. Another scenario to see where the likely U.S. line would be is around a de facto Chinese blockade. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, the U.S. put a blockade around Cuba to stop Russian ships coming with missiles, choking off the island. The U.S. stated that any ship that came through the blockade would have to be pulled over, stopped, boarded, and inspected by the U.S. Navy looking for weapons. 
which everyone knew that the Russian Navy would never allow themselves to be subjected to. The US called it a quarantine rather than a blockade because a blockade is technically an act of war. So I want to run a similar scenario to today. Let's say for the sake of the argument, the Beijing government accuses Taiwan of sending guns to Hong Kong separatists and demands to put a blockade around Taiwan to prevent ships coming in and out without an inspection by the People's Liberation Navy. Do you think this would trigger a full US response if the Chinese were to effectively blockade Taiwan looking for weapons, but calling it a quarantine? I think it would, because I think it would see a blockade as an act of war. Um, I think, um, though, again, you raise a very interesting point, because China could word it in a way and do it in a way where it could ignite an argument in Washington, which is what China would want. China wants Washington to be at each other's throats, to essentially have a big debate in Washington about this, whether or not it constitutes an act of war, whether or not they should invade Taiwan, because indecision is equivalent to weakness in this particular issue. I know that if it was ever understood that China would would dominate Taiwan, then the whole system, the whole U.S. defense alliance structure in East Asia, from Japan south to Australia, would be in danger because deterrence is a problematic concept. Nobody is really sure if you mean it. Therefore, you always have to say over and over again that you will defend such and such a place for it to have any meaning whatsoever. But if there's indecision in the face of a crisis, then uh, countries from Japan to Australia would have to make side deals with China. Because China is not like America. China is in Asia. It is the demographic, economic, military organizing principle of Asia, whereas the United States is half a world away. The United States is in China is in East Asia because it wants to be, not because it has to be, and because of tradition. But tradition can change. It can be broken. Therefore, uh, therefore, because China is not going away, any indecision or apparent failure on America's part would disrupt the whole, the, all, all the alliance understandings going back to, 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 to after the Second World War. With China having a veto power in the UN, do you think there is any circumstance that China would allow Taiwan to become a fully sovereign, recognized nation? No, I don't think so. I think this is something the Chinese feel very strongly about. It's very emotional. It's very deep. Um, you know, you know, you you won't you won't get any won't get very far trying to rationalize why they feel this way, but they do. And they and so they're exploring various scenarios, some of which you mentioned, very creative cyber attack, uh, you know, various uh, disinformation campaigns, intelligence operations, anything that they can do to weaken the fabric of Taiwanese democracy would help uh, would help China. In other words, China is seeking to avoid ever having to invade Taiwan while also pulling Taiwan closer to China. My final question here is why do you think Taiwan is so important to China? Is it for strategic reasons or is it more cultural and political? Well, it's important to China for historical reasons. Remember, China has reconsolidated Hong Kong, Macau. It's taken virtual economic possession of outer Mongolia. Um, it's the last part of of historic China that that the mainland wants to uh, engulf, um, and uh, and there are also strategic issues because Ch uh, because China Taiwan is like a big aircraft carrier off the coast of uh, off the coast of of the Asian mainland, and were China ever to own Taiwan, it's str the strategic position of its navy vis-a-vis -vis Japan, vis-a-vis -vis the South China Sea would be infinitely stronger.
China's very own North Korea problem, Taiwan. Xi Jinping has thrown down the gauntlet and he started a ticking clock on this situation. And that can can't be kicked down the road any further. But what are the options here? An invasion of Taiwan would be immensely painful for the Chinese, even without the rest of the world getting involved. Remember the Allies lost just under 10,000 soldiers in the opening days of the invasion of Normandy in World War II. And back then the Germans had far less artillery, no smart missiles, under a quarter of what the Taiwanese could deploy in manpower, and the Allies had wider landing zones as well. And to make things even worse, the Germans were famously taken by surprise with the landings at Normandy, and they had most of their forces deployed to the east near Calais. But that wouldn't be the case today. The Taiwanese have access to satellites, and the moment the Chinese leave harbour, the Chinese would likely locate them and be able to reconcentrate their forces onto the narrow kill zone beaches. And all of these problems the Chinese face is now over a 90 mile stretch of much rougher water rather than the 10 miles of the English Channel. An invasion would be a nightmare for the Chinese, no matter how many extra men they have. Because it doesn't matter if you have 2 million men, if you can only get 80,000 across at a time, onto a beach that fits barely 3,000. And as soon as the invasion starts, even in the miracle the Chinese have some sort of surprise, a new clock starts ticking. The countdown of the arrival of other allied forces like the US, Japan, South Korea, and Australia, who at that moment will be likely mobilizing their naval forces to engage the Chinese. An encounter at this point, the Chinese will be very likely to lose, leaving whatever Chinese men left on the landing zones without supplies, without food, and without a retreat path. So Beijing has to look at other options, a blockade, a cyber attack, but neither of those would really solve the problem, and both still risk a US response particularly in the ratcheting tensions between Beijing and Washington. Even trying by peaceful diplomatic means would be very unlikely to yield the kind of response the Chinese are looking for now that there's a set date of 2049. The Chinese also know that relations with the US are getting worse and not better, and the US may be willing to put more of a presence onto Taiwan, making any capture of it even more difficult. It's not likely today. But the way things are changing, the US may even play a similar card to Pyongyang and allow Taiwan to have nuclear weapons, even further complicating an already tenuous situation for China if they were planning on invading Taiwan. The South China Sea is a huge tension point in the world, but the South China Sea doesn't have a countdown clock on it. The Taiwan question, though, does. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. It was our first one of 2021 and we could not be happier with it. The support we received last year was absolutely amazing and we cannot thank each and every one of you guys and girls enough. If you want to help support the show or get more content, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, and our personal Discord on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or you can find me on Twitter at Mike Hilliard Oz. Oz is in Australia. The idea for this episode actually came from one of our Patreons, Thomas Chen, who himself lives in Taipei. And like many of our amazing Patreons, Tom donates a few bucks a month to help keep this show going, and every dollar he donates goes right back into the program. We do Patreon Q&As, and I regularly catch up with individual Patreons for beers or tea via Zoom. And I've been so lucky to meet so many great people. I count my blessings every day with the amazing Patreons I have. So if you like what we do here and you want to help us stay fully independent so we can keep chasing bigger and better stories, please feel free to donate a couple of dollars a month to our Patreon. Links to which you can find on our website, www.theredlinepodcast.com. I want to give thanks to our amazing panel of guests this week. Eric Gomez is one of the best people you will ever meet on the planet and a great combination of knowledge as well as wisdom. It would be hard to find anyone else in this industry who is as friendly or funny as Eric is. This is the second time we've had him on the show. He was on our North Korea piece, and I pray it won't be the last. If you want to check out some of Eric's amazing work on everything from Chinese politics to East Asian nuclear policy, you can find him on Twitter on the handle at Eric Gomez Asia. Sheena Chesnut Greitens is also a returning guest, having been part of our Philippines piece last year. And if there were anyone that could rival Eric for sheer personality, it would probably be Sheena. Sheena has worked with all of the big guns in the industry for years now, 
and keeps accurately predicting many of the moves in the region before anyone else does. Her analysis is always amazing and I highly recommend you check out Sheena's work. And you can find Sheena on Twitter on the handle at Sheena Greitens. And I also recommend you check out her book, Dictators and Their Secret Police, which along with Eric's book, America's Nuclear Crossroads, made my top reads of 2020 list. They were absolutely fantastic. I've been a fan of Robert Kaplan's work for years, and his book Asia's Cauldron is probably the best book you can possibly hope for to fully understand China and the geopolitics of the South China Sea. I've wanted to get Rob on the show for absolutely ages now, and it was finally great to get him on for such a great episode topic. We will be very sure to invite him back on the program, but for now, I recommend you go check out his website, robertdkaplan.com, where you can purchase multiple books and also ask questions of him there. This show would not be possible without my amazing team. The chapter titles are narrated by the always amazing Mark Spencer, who himself runs the amazing Climactic Network, an entire network of shows all dedicated to the subject of climate change. We are incredibly lucky to have Mark on the team and to keep hearing his lovely voice for every single episode. I hope we have many more with him coming up as he's been with us for all of 2020 and I'm looking forward to him being here for all of 2021. If you want to check out Mark's stuff on Twitter, you can find him on the handle at Climactic Show. Owen Swift has just joined the team here at the Red Line, and he has been an absolutely amazing addition to the team. Setting up our own dedicated Red Line Discord so we can play games and hang out and ask questions, helping with the new website design, and starting to write a number of amazing articles that go into the finer details of these subjects, so you can go even deeper on already deep dives. We are very lucky to have Owen as part of the Red Line team, as he comes highly recommended from a number of Thick Tanks. You can find Owen on Twitter at the handle at Owen A. Swift. The reason this show sounds so crisp is thanks to the amazing Joe Hawthorne, who helps clean and prepare the audio for each episode. Joe is one of the best audio guys out there and continues to blow me away with his talent. If you're looking to get your show to sound as good as it can be, I cannot recommend anyone more highly than Joe Hawthorne. And you can find Joe at the Twitter handle at Joe Hawthorne 77. And the last thanks, as always, goes out to you for listening to the program. Over the last two weeks, we crossed the million streams mark. And that, to me, is the best Christmas present a man could ever hope for. Every one of your messages, tweets, and comments are all read by me personally. And I am grateful for every single one of them. So thank you for all of your support. And I'm always here to help you guys if you ever need it as well. So if you need anything, please feel free to reach out. Because you guys have helped me, and all I want to do is help you. I hope you all had a great New Year's, and I'm looking forward to tackling even better stories in 2021. As always, the show will be back in a fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you, and good night.